Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you joined us for this worship experience here at St. John's Lutheran Church. We're located in Brookfield, Wisconsin, on the corner of Barker and, and I always forget the Davidson, Barker and Davidson Road. So, uh, welcome. And I'm going to turn it over to our guys over here to, for the opening song. Thanks, guys. Amen. Well, we're in the book of Mark. And we've just begun the book of Mark. We started in Advent. And now we're in the first chapter of Mark, and there has been a lot going on in this one chapter. That's, that's, that's what's unique about Mark in the Gospels. Boy, he's right to the point. He moves the, he moves the action along. So I want to just recap what's been going on in chapter 1. First of all, Mark announces that you're going to hear about the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the good news. Then we're going to hear about John the Baptist coming out of the wilderness to proclaim the one who's coming. And then Jesus comes. And Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. 
And then the Holy Spirit immediately guides him, drives him into the wilderness himself, where he faces Satan for 40 days and 40 nights. Now coming out of the wilderness, he chooses his disciples. It's kind of like, I'm not going to do this alone. I'm going to have some folks with me to share in my ministry. And so he calls Peter and the disciples to follow him, and they do, immediately. Not a lot of drama there. They just drop their nets and they go. And now that they are together, we pick up the story still in chapter 1. And we also hear that John has been arrested. John the Baptist has been arrested. So, if you're following along and you want to read along, I'm reading from Mark 1, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 1, starting with the 21st verse. Okay? So they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you do? What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. And this ends our gospel lesson for today. And, of course, Mark packs a lot in here. So, what did you hear in that reading? What jumped out at you? For me, the word authority jumped out at me. Uh, It jumps out at me today especially. We're taping on Inauguration Day when the authority uh, of the president, of the outgoing president, moves to the incoming president. Now, the authority itself resides in the office of the presidency, and these two men occupied One occupied, and now one will occupy this office that has the authority. But where does this authority come from in our democracy? Well, in our democracy, the authority comes from the people. They uh, they vote, we vote, we elect, and we grant the authority to, to the person in the office to accomplish things on our behalf. Issues of authority are difficult. We know that. Well, for instance, well, if you're parents, you have authority over your children. And as small children, they, well, they obey your authority, not without some crying every once in a while, but they obey your authority as as parents. Now, when you get to be a teenager, well, there's a little pushing back, a little pushing back of that authority as, as the child grows and starts establishing his or her, her own identity, independence, and some authority of their own. And we love the teenage years because that's the time when it's, boy, it, can, it goes back and forth, doesn't it? There's, 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 on the one hand, there's, there's acceptance of authority, and then there's also resistance to it. 
Now, then we get a job and we find out that there is someone else now who has authority over us. I think we call that person a boss. Someone who is above us, who gives us directions, who has the authority to do that. And again, like most of us, we accept that authority. We've accepted the job. We've accepted the terms. But, you know, there are times when we will push back a little bit on that authority as well. We do it in, a, in many different ways, especially if the boss isn't too popular or you don't agree with the boss. Sometimes we will, we will form a resistance group to that authority figure, trying to gain some power over to challenge some of that authority. Uh, I've, I've worked in a number of, of places, and, and this happens quite often, where perhaps the leader has said or done something or made a decision that is not too popular, and there are ways in which a bureaucracy or a staff or, you know, when I was on staff, there are ways in which we try, we try to accept, but there was also some some resistance to it as well. Authority. Who has authority? In a congregation, as a pastor, when I declare uh, the forgiveness of sins, I'm not doing that on my authority. It says, on the authority of Jesus Christ as an ordained minister in the church of Christ, I forgive you your sins. I don't have that authority. I am a representative of that authority. Now in the Lutheran church, Martin Luther also said that the pastoral office is a calling that has been given by the congregation who has given the office of the pastor the authority to do certain things for the congregation. In the ELCA, once we are not called as a pastor, after three years or six years, we're considered off the roster, and then we have to go through all sorts of things in order to get back on the roster, meaning that our authority as pastor rests solely on the congregation, not by some special charism or spirit that, that makes it indelible, that makes it eternal. It's a function of, of the congregation. It's different than, than other churches. Why do I bring this, this issue of authority up? Well, it's the same issue that the scribes are having with Jesus. He comes into the synagogue and he starts teaching with authority. And, and they're asking, well, where did this guy come from? Why is he teaching and why should we listen to him? Did he go through a rabbinical school? Did he have, does he have a reputation in, in Judaism for being a great teacher? Where did he come from? So where is his authority? Did the chief priest give it to him? What? But there is one who knows clearly who Jesus is and what kind of authority he has. It's the unclean spirit the demon. Boy, he knows exactly who Jesus is. And when we read Mark, it's, the, it's always the demons who understand Jesus perfectly, right from the start. The humans, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, even the disciples don't quite get where Jesus is coming from yet. And even when he casts this demon out, and it's interesting that this man is sitting in the synagogue with this unclean spirit. You would think with an unclean spirit, he wouldn't be anywhere near a synagogue, but there he is. And Jesus casts this spirit out, and then they say, whoa, he must have some kind of authority to do something like that. And so throughout all of Scripture, throughout all of the stories, they're going to come back to that. By whose authority are you doing this? Well, of course, we know that the authority comes from God himself because he is God. He has the authority because he's God. 
the ultimate authority, the eternal authority. All the rest of the authorities on this earth, are, they're transient, they're, 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 they're time limited, they are, um, well, they're not eternal, that's for sure. Because we come and go. And the authority that we thought we have, that's not a permanent thing. But for Jesus, it's, it is eternal because he is the Son of God. And those demons know it. So it got me to think, you know, as I sit in church and as we do, or as we sit at home now, um, uh, waiting for that time when we can gather again, the unclean spirit, the demon, what is that demon? Because, boy, we, care. we were just talking before the service today about, you know, the demon talking. You know, and I, sometimes I'm, I'm grateful that there's only one talking to me inside right here. You know, there's usually a committee that's going on. And what is, and what is the demon? Well, it, the demon really is fear. And from that come, and come self-righteous anger. Self-pity, you name them, they're there. And it's so interesting that in the gospel lesson, that the man with the unclean, unclean spirit is saying, what do you have to do with us? And then there's another story as we know, the name of the demon is Legion, yeah. But boy, it has one source, I think. Fear. Fear is the demon. And once fear gets a hold of you, it can manifest in so many different ways, just like I've described with the, with the self-righteous anger towards others or the self-pity that somehow the world isn't treating me the way I think it should treat me or the, the need to, to, for success in order to build myself up. And, 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 and that, that demon, boy, that's, hard, that's a hard one to feed. Because just as you think you're successful, along comes another thing which threatens your success or the fear of failure. Oh my gosh, what would people think if I failed at something? I would be less than what they, what they think of me. People pleasing. You've got to please everybody in order to feel good about yourself. Well, good luck with that one. There's so many, but, it, but they're rooted in that fear. And so when Jesus, who has authority here in Scripture, and who we claim has authority in our lives, how does Jesus enter into our church? How does Jesus enter into our lives and casts that demon out? You know, the scribes couldn't get it. And boy, talk about forming resistance parties. <laughs> they were resisting him all the way to the cross. And on the cross, they probably said, Aha, now. He can't threaten our authority anymore. Well, they had another surprise coming, didn't they? But we resist sometimes within ourselves because Jesus says love your enemy oh yeah that's not going to happen too fast is it surrender um, yeah I'll surrender most of the things but I, to surrender everything to God um, can I keep just a little bit of that self pity you know can I, can I keep just some of that ambition for myself Jesus asks us to surrender to him who has authority even over the demons. But we resist, don't we, a little bit? When we come to forgiveness, well, I, don't, I can forgive. I, I need forgiveness of some sins, but others, they're not sins. I was, I, I'm, I'm right, and they're wrong, and therefore, yeah. Now, Jesus, Jesus does not come to overpower our demons but boy, he drives them out when we surrender by love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. That drives out the fear. It's called faith. I have faith in Christ. I can put my life in Christ's hands. And now I don't have to justify myself 
to anyone. I only need to love everyone as I love myself. You are no longer my enemy because you too have been created by God in God's image. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, driving out those demons. I I don't know about you, but I can't do it myself. They're too powerful. I need God. I need to surrender in God. And it's God who casts out the unclean spirit and makes us clean again. He has made us clean through baptism. He continues to make us clean through our through Holy Communion. He makes us clean by our daily devotion, saying, Today, Lord, I am yours. Do with me what you will. Not easy, is it? That's why we gather at home with our friends. And when we gather in person once again, even though we may not dis- even though we may not agree with one another over many things, we can still come together as brothers and sisters in Christ with forgiveness and with love and with open ears to hear the Word of God who is our authority in our lives. So, thanks be to God that God has the power and the authority to do for us what we just can't do for ourselves. To love us so that we can love each other. Amen. All right, guys, take it away. I am 
Amen, guys. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious and most merciful God, we come together through these virtual means, but through your Holy Spirit that connects us no matter where we are. We come together in, in your word to live out your calling to us, to, to grant us strength through, the, through your mercy. We ask in these times of, of challenges and of difficulty and, yes, of fear, we ask that you come to us with your Holy Spirit to provide the strength we need to move through the day and through the week to, to be with one another. We ask, Lord, in this time that you grant your Holy Spirit to, to provide healing for those who are sick, to provide healing for those who are suffering from uh, mental uh, illness, to provide healing for those who are suffering from depression, from addiction, and all of those other demons that, that plague many of us. We ask that you bless our country. We ask that you bless the leadership of our country. And we ask that you bless all of us to work together to solve the problems that face us. We pray for those who, whose family, we, we pray for the families who have lost someone to death. And we lift their names up to you. And we thank you for the saints who have who have come before us, who have handed down this faith that we share. And finally, Lord, we ask that you continue to bless St. John's Lutheran Church for the missions and the ministries that we do for so many people. May we make a difference in people's lives according to to your will. We ask all of these things, Lord, in your name, and in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Now, please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ has been broken and has been given for you. And the blood of Christ has been shed for you. May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace.
Amen. Guys. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence alone. I've tasted and seen the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is unknown in your presence Lord your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are well Amen. Amen. Now may God
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. I just have one announcement today. On uh, February 17th, it is Ash Wednesday. And of course, because we are not uh, gathering in person yet, uh, we will provide you with some information on how we will do Ash Wednesday with the imposition of ashes and devotionals and so forth uh, to you so that uh, you will be prepared uh, for our Ash Wednesday observance. And then uh, following that, uh, Pastor Frank Janzo and Pastor Karen Natterstad and I are uh, creating a, a series, a sermon series for Lent. And we're going to title it, call, it's going to be called Great Expectations. Great Expectations. Basically at the heart of it is we carry, we carry so many expectations around with us of, 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 so many, of, of, our, of our family, of our friends, of our work, of our church, our communities. And we also have expectations, really, of God and our expectations of Christ. And, and conversely, what are the expectations of God? What are the ex expectations of Christ on us? So through some biblical stories, we're going to explore that relationship that we have with God in Christ and what it means for the expectations that we have and whether our expectations are spot on or whether they're way too high or maybe even too low and do we need to look at our expectations in this life of faith. It's, it's an intriguing a theme that we want to flesh out. So, uh, so Pastor, Pastors Karen and Pastor Frank and I are going to take two sermons um, and we'll, we'll intersperse them through the six weeks of, of Lent, including Palm Sunday, on this theme. So please uh, join us for that and more to come. Well, go in peace, be at peace. Surrender to the Lord and his authority, and grace will be among you. Amen.